Good morning, church, and turn in your Bible to Exodus chapter 20. We'll be back in the Ten Commandments this morning where we left off just before Christmas and the last time I preached on the Lord's Day was Christmas Eve, so I've had a few weeks off and it was about three days before Christmas Eve that we had our last day of sunshine. And um, so it looks like the sun was out this morning, which is kind of nice. Um, but we're in Exodus 20, verses 1 through 21, and I'll read the Ten Commandments, and we'll be looking at the Eighth Commandment again this morning. That's where we were when we gathered last, or at least when I was preaching last from the Ten Commandments the week before Christmas. Exodus 20, verse 1, and God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountains smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off. And said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Let's have prayer together. Father in heaven, we come to you and we are grateful for your law, which is a light unto our path and provides wisdom for all of life. Teach us, instruct us, help us not to just be mere hearers of the law, but doers. We pray that the preaching and hearing would be anointed by the Spirit of God, that you would move with power and might among us, and that you would do a great work here today, strengthening and edifying your people and saving sinners. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're back in the Ten Commandments, as I said, and the Ten Commandments are a guide for life. Really, they are the natural law, they're the constitution of reality. And when I say they're the constitution of reality, what I mean is, is that this is how God designed the world. So if you want to live in the world the way God designed the world, you're going to live in the world according to the Ten Commandments in all the ways they apply. They give you light to your path, they give you wisdom to your way, and they speak to you as you go along in life is your counselors, your advisors. The Ten Commandments are your counselors and advisors. The Ten Commandments is the constitution of reality. Now, the Ten Commandments teach us, with being our advisors and with being the constitution of reality, the Ten Commandments teach us what sin is. So if you don't do the law, you do sin, right? If you do do the law, you do righteousness. The Ten Commandments teach us what sin is. And in teaching us what sin is, they teach us that we're sinners. 
So as you come to the Ten Commandments, you can't come to them saying, oh, this is the way to get saved, to get my sins forgiven. You can't do that because they're not going to forgive your sins. They're, it's hard, cold law. It's true. It's righteousness. But the Ten Commandments are cold, hard law. They're inflexible. And what they do in teaching you that you're a sinner is they teach you that you need Jesus Christ. So while they're a guide for life, they give light to your path, they're counselors along the way, they teach you that you're a sinner, they cannot save you, and they cannot forgive your sins. They just won't do it. And for that, you need to go to Jesus. So as I'm teaching from God's law this morning, you come under conviction of sin and the law needles around in your heart and, you know kind of pokes away at your conscience, what you should do is you should go immediately to Jesus for forgiveness. Go to Christ to find forgiveness for your sins. And what the law cannot do, Jesus does do. He will forgive you. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, I introduced the Eighth Commandment last week, Exodus 20, verse 15, and the Eighth Commandment is, you shall not steal. That's the Eighth Commandment. Our last time I was preaching, at least from the Ten Commandments. You shall not steal. That's the Eighth Commandment. And the Eighth Commandment, we should remember, as W.S. Plumer said, it regulates our labor, our buying, our selling, our expenditures, and our entire civil conduct. The Eighth Commandment, in all of the principles that are embedded in it, is God's economic policy for society. The macro level, it's God's economic policy for the state. And on the micro level, it is God's standard of wealth management for yourself. How should you manage your wealth? Well, you should manage it in accordance with the Eighth Commandment. Now, when I say in accordance with the Eighth Commandment, some of you will just say, well, okay, my wealth management is you shall not steal. No, like you have to understand one of the Jesus' criticisms of the Pharisees is that the Pharisees were upholding the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. The letter of the law is you shall not steal, and so we don't want to steal. But there's more embedded in the law within the actual spirit of the law. The spirit governs our affections, our desires, and the spirit helps us interpret the law as the rest of the Bible is, interprets the law for us. And there's various principles that the rest of the Bible reveals in interpreting the law. So... Sixth commandment, you shall not steal. Well, of course, if you shall not steal, it protects private property. So we have this concept of private property on the macro level, which your property is yours to take care of, and my property is mine to take care of, and we all have property to take care of. The eighth commandment on the macro level, it limits the state's ability or prerogative to tax and regulate. So yes, the state has prerogative of taxation, and regulation, but this commandment severely limits that prerogative so that there's a limitation on what the state can take from you and what the state can tell you to do with your assets and with your property. And then it, with it embedded within this, this becomes the foundation for free enterprise and capitalism. Some people think that free enterprise and capitalism are founded on greed. No, they're not founded on greed. They're founded on private property rights. And private property rights find their existence within the Ten Commandments. The Eighth Commandment specifically is the first principles of economics. You have there the foundation for free enterprise and capitalism. Now, that's macro issues. I talked about that a little bit last week. And today, I want to bring it right down and deal with micro issues. So while the Ten Commandments are God's economic policy for the state, the Ten Commandments, the Eighth Commandment specifically, tells you how you should manage your wealth. It's right there. And that's what I'm going to talk about today on the micro level. And so, here's, here's how it, it all plays out. If you shouldn't steal from others, which the Eighth Commandment prohibits, well, that means you shouldn't steal from yourself. Right? You should protect your wealth, in other words. If you don't steal from others, you shouldn't. You shouldn't steal from yourself. You should protect your wealth. And if you're going it, to, it's, it's like the, the commandment, you shall not murder. Well, that, that doesn't just mean you shouldn't kill your neighbor. It means you shouldn't kill yourself. Well, you shall not steal means you shouldn't steal your neighbor's wealth. You shouldn't steal someone else's resources. But it also means that you shouldn't squander 
your resources. And if you shouldn't squander your resources, well, what else should you do? That means you should protect your resources. Okay, so not squandering means protecting your resources. And if you want to flip it and take it even further so you're getting at the principle of what's being spoken here, not only should you not squander your resources, but, but you should multiply your resources, your material wealth. So all of these principles are embedded in it as you just start applying consistent rules of logic and biblical interpretation to the Eighth Commandment. If you, if you shouldn't steal from others, you shouldn't steal from yourself. If you shouldn't steal from yourself, you shouldn't squander your wealth. And if you shouldn't squander your wealth, then the opposite is true of squandering. You should multiply your wealth. All of these things are embedded within the Eighth Commandment. And this is what we're going to talk about today on the micro level. Multiplying your wealth, handling your wealth, protecting your wealth. But before I outline my sermon, which I will in just a moment, I'm going to quote Edward Fisher because I found him to be so helpful on this. And in interpreting the Eighth Commandment, this is what he says. That is, thou shalt by no unlawful way or means hurt or hinder the wealth and outward estate either of thyself or others. So what's that say? Don't steal from others. Don't take from others what's not yours. And protect what is yours. Protect your wealth, your property, your assets. So that's the first of what he says. And an affirmative, so the positive side of it, Part included in these words, but thou shalt by all good means preserve and further them both. So what's that mean? Well, you, you need to preserve your wealth, not just don't steal from others, but preserve it and further them, multiply them. And not just your wealth, but the wealth of others. And so wrapped up in this commandment, I'm just going to switch to the macro level one more time to talk about public life and we'll deal with private life for the most of the sermon. But this is, when I talk about public wealth, this is something we should be seeking to multiply too, is we multiply our private wealth. And what do I mean when I say multiply public wealth? Well, when I talk about multiplying public wealth, I'm not talking about multiplying the government's wealth, although the government will get more wealthy as public wealth is multiplied. When, I'm when I talk about multiplying public wealth, what I'm talking about is producing an economy and a community that is productive. And multiplying public wealth is simply increasing what economists call the GDP, or the gross domestic product. So that the society, a productive society, is a society that is multiplying its own wealth over time. Productive individuals lead to productive families, lead to productive communities, what leads to a productive economy. Okay, so individuals that are nothing but consumers, they take. Families that are nothing but consumers, take. Societies that are nothing but consumers take, right? And then, and then GDP, gross domestic product, goes down. So what I'm, what I'm talking about when I talk about multiplication of public wealth, I'm talking about creating a society or a community that is productive. When everyone's productive together, everyone's productive. And assets eventually get multiplied. But I'm not talking about primarily the macro level, which is the GDP this morning. I'm talking about the micro level. How do you contribute to wealth production? How do you as an individual contribute to wealth production? And produce wealth and protect wealth and manage wealth. And so what I'm going to do is I apply the Eighth Commandment to your personal life and talk about preserving, building, and multiplying wealth. I'm going to give you three points that pertain to this. And the first point is this. I'm going to define wealth and ask the question, what is it? What is wealth? I'm going to define it, talk about what it's not, what it is. So I'll spend some time doing that. Secondly, I'm going to talk about developing wealth. So how do you use wealth? How do you use money? Wealth, how do you use it? After I define it, then how do you use it? And then thirdly, I'm going to talk about donating wealth. Who owns it? And the reality is, is we like to think we own it, but everything is God's. And so God has the ultimate say on how we manage our wealth. So defining wealth, what is wealth, developing wealth, okay, how do you use wealth, and donating wealth, who owns your wealth. But let's talk with this first point, defining wealth. What is it? What is wealth? When I talk about wealth and money, no, I'm not talking about money actually, you'll find that in a minute. When I talk about wealth, what am I talking about? And what I'll start by saying is what I'm not talking about. So let me just start by what I'm not talking about. 
as I ask the question, what is wealth? What, I, what am I not talking about? I'm not talking about spiritual blessings and salvation. Right? So Proverbs 11 verse 4 tells us there's one thing that wealth cannot do. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. So, you know, you could be rich and you could go to hell. You could be poor and you can go to hell. You can be rich and you can go to heaven. You can be poor and go to heaven. And so I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about your salvation when I talk about wealth. I'm not talking about whether you're going to go to heaven when I'm talking about wealth. I'm talking about material wealth. The, okay, that's what I'm discussing here. Or, I mean, I think there's relations between the spiritual and the material, but today I'm talking specifically about the material. And when I talk about wealth, I'm not talking about eternal life. I, I'm not talking about quality of life either. There's a difference between um, quality of life and wealth. And we'll see this in the Bible. So Proverbs 15, verse 17 says, Better is dinner of, a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened calf and hatred with it. So what's that saying? It's saying you can have wealth, but you can have poor quality of life. All right? So, so you, you, if you go down and you have a dinner as a family, and you have a salad, that's all you have for dinner, but everybody loves each other, that's quality of life. Or you go down and you have a dinner with a family and everyone, and you have a fattened calf and you have steak and you have potatoes and gravy and fine wine, but everybody hates each other and fights. That's not quality of life. Okay? You, you, but you can have dinner together and have a, a, a mangy little salad and, 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 and everybody fights. And you can have dinner together and have steak and potatoes and gravy and, and wine and everyone gets along. Okay? I mean, I, you have four options there. I think the, the last one I said is the best option, right? But I think that what, what I am trying to say, though, is wealth is not indic necessarily indicative of quality of life. There's other things that go into quality of life than wealth. Proverbs 16, verse 8 says, Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. And, and this, is, uh, this is speaking on a social level. What this is telling us is it's better to live in a society that values righteousness but is poor than a society that is unjust but is wealthy. So where do we live? Well, there's prosperity in this country, but there's wickedness and injustice reigning. And because there's wickedness and injustice reigning in this country, wealth is now being squandered and we're being decapitalized because of the wickedness. And it's, but the society was built up to the place of prosperity by righteousness. So, and, and as you go in, you know, you have election seasons that come up, and there might be one another year or two. And you think about this, we, what, is, what is the big platform line? Well, it's all about the economy, don't you know? Well, not really. Because according to this Bible verse, right, you're, you're better to live where there's justice and poverty than injustice and good economy. Because eventually injustice will produce bad economy. It just eventually goes that way. And so what I'm not talking about when I talk about wealth, I'm not talking about quality of life. Quality of life and wealth are two different things. They can be related, but they're distinct conversations. I'm not talking about quality of life. Proverbs 17.1 similarly says, Better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. I'm not talking about quality of life. So I'm not talking about salvation I'm not talking about quality of life. What am I talking about as I seek to define wealth? As I seek to define wealth, what is wealth? What am I talking about? And when I talk about wealth, I'm talking about the ability to acquire your needs and wants when you need and want them. That's what wealth is. It's the ability to acquire your needs and wants when you need and want them. So you have needs. Right? You need food, clothing, shelter, heat, water. And so wealth is the ability to get your hands on those things when you need them. And then you have wants. Right? What, do you, what, do you, what are your wants? Well, you want a vacation. Okay, you, you, you want a nicer vehicle. You want a bigger home, a nicer property. These are wants. They're not needs. They're wants. And, and wealth is the ability to get your hands on those wants when you want them. So they were talking about material things here. 
The Bible has something very serious to say about material things because material affects the spiritual, the spiritual affects the material, always in Bible. And so when I'm talking about wealth, I'm talking about the ability to acquire what you need and what you want when you need and when you want it. That's what I'm talking about. And the Bible assumes, as you, you look through the scriptures, it begins in early as Genesis, even in Genesis 2, it assumes that there are certain material goods on earth that store value. So, for example, gold, silver, and precious jewels. They store value. So if I have gold, silver, and precious jewels, I can take that gold, silver, and precious jewels, and I can turn it into wealth because it stores wealth. And so it, it becomes, all of a sudden, gold, silver, precious jewels, so on, can become food, vacations, cars, um, property, you name it. it. It translates into that. It's storing value. There's value that's stored in those items. And so when we come and we, we talk about wealth, we're talking in part about having items that store value which when we want to use them, we can use them to purchase the goods that we need or want. And some of us fall into the trap, you might do this, you might fall into the trap of equating money with wealth, currency with wealth. You got so much money in your bank account or you got so much money stuffed under your mattress and you're like, well, that's wealth. Well, not necessarily. Money can translate into goods and services very quickly but our, 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 our financial system, our monetary system right now is completely dependent upon the perception of the public. It's a bit of a mirage. It's smoke and mirrors. It used to be that our, our, our dollar was backed up by gold. So you, there was a gold standard and our dollar was backed up by gold, but now our dollar is just paper. And um, our nickels were even made out of nickel at one point in time. So you, they were worth something because they were a precious metal. Right? Well, uh, no longer. So, so what we, uh, in pennies were copper and, and so on. So, and they're, they're valuable. Why did they start, stop using pennies? Well, because they're, they're not worth the metal that they make them out of anymore. And so, but, but what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is it used to be that our money was backed up by what the Bible attributes value to. You know, precious metals and jewels and so on. Well, now our money just floats out there and it's, it's a bit of a smoke and mirrors and it's a mirage. Okay, And so I'm, what I'm trying to say is you can't say just because you have money, you have wealth. Because the inflation is causing wealth to decrease. You could have $1,000 in your bank account, but that $1,000 is going to be worth less than $1,000 in a year because of inflation. Right? And so that's not necessarily wealth, although it can be. But the Bible talks about it assumes that value is stored in gold, silver, precious metals, and precious jewels. And what is wealth? Wealth is the ability to store value so that you can get what you need or want when you need or want it. That's what it is. That's what, that's what wealth is. The ability to store value so that you can get what you need or want when you need or want it. I'm talking about material wealth. That's wealthiness. If you have value stored so that you can get what you need or want when you need or want it, you have wealth. You can store value in a cow. A cow is worth a certain amount of money, right? You can store value in gold. And yes, you can even store it in your bank account, although I'm, I'm trying to indicate that there is a level of instability within the currency because it is simply a mirage at this point in time. So I've defined wealth. What is wealth? What is wealth? I've talked about it. Wealth is the ability to get what you need or want when you need or want it. Now, let's talk about developing wealth. So if you have wealth or you know how to get wealth, how do you develop it? Because this is commanded and expected in Scripture. How do you use it? How do you use wealth? This is, we're shifting gears here. I've defined it. Now I want to talk about how to use it. Wealth should be acquired, and the wealth that is acquired should be protected and multiplied. Wealth should be acquired, and the wealth that is acquired should be protected and multiplied. Now, in these unstable times, you might say, well, it's a really good idea for me to get wealth 
and then take my wealth and put it in a box and dig a hole in my backyard and hide it there. And when the chips fall, I'm going to go get it. Right? Everything collapses and there's mayhem. I'm going to go find my wealth that I hid in my backyard and I'm, and I'm going to like a squirrel before the winter time. He hides all his chestnuts in the ground and then when the snow finally comes, he goes and finds his chestnuts. At least he thinks he's going to find them. Right? And that's what you might, that's my, that might be how you treat wealth. Well, Jesus says, no, that's not how you treat wealth. Wealth, should, yes, you should store some wealth because you might want to store it for a rainy day, just like the ant does. But wealth ultimately is given to you to multiply. And Jesus talks about this in the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 through 30. And if you remember the parable of the talents, I'm not going to read it, but if you remember it, you remember there's a few servants that the master gives talents to. One he gives so many talents to, another he gives so many talents to, another he gives so many talents to. The one servant multiplies the talents, and then the master rewards him for multiplying the talents. The next servant multiplies the talents, a little less, but the master still rewards him for multiplying the talents. The sir, third servant takes his talents, he buries them, and then doesn't multiply them, brings them back to the master, and the master basically says, you wasted your talents, you're going to hell, Right? So uh, this, is, this is the parable of the talents. And so the expectation within the parable of the talents that Jesus um, exposits for us is that God expects you to take what you're given and multiply it. And you apply that principle to all of life, specifically to finances and to wealth management today, and you should be able to see that God expects you to take your ability to gain, your ability to acquire, and he doesn't expect you just to protect it, but he expects you to multiply it. He wants you to multiply it. He wants you to multiply it. And you find this is embedded in the Eighth Commandment, because the Eighth Commandment forbids you from stealing, which means you're not allowed to squander your wealth. Don't squander your wealth. And then the opposite of squandering your wealth is multiplying your wealth. So all of that, Jesus' economic policy on the parable of the talents, is embedded right there in the Eighth Commandment. So that's, that's what I talk about. I talk about multiplying. You have a responsibility to take what God's given you and to build something with it, to multiply it. And, I, and I'll illustrate it this way. I'll illustrate it this way. There's three ways that you can use what God gives you. Three ways. One is squander, two is store, three is multiply. I see no other way. One is squander, two is store, three is multiply. So let's say you get 50 bucks. That's your talent. You got $50. You, you can take this $50 and you can do one of several things with it. One, you can squander it. So what's squandering $50 looks like? Well, you say, I'm going to take my $50, I'm going to take my friend out to the movie, and we're going to buy Coke and popcorn and Skittles, and, and then that $50 is gone. You'll, you'll never see that again. There's not even nutritional value in the food. Right? There's nothing multiplied. There, there's no return on the investment. It's gone. It's finished, okay, for an hour and a half at the movie. So that's $50 squandered. If that was your last $50, that would be a really bad decision. $50 squandered. Or you could do $50 stored. So you get, you get a waterproof box, and you take your $50, and you bury it in your backyard, and you're going to save that for when you need it in the future. Or you get your $50, and you buy silver, and you bury the silver in your backyard. Or you get your $50, and you put it in your savings account, and you leave it, leave it there. You're storing it. But even just by storing cash, you're losing cash because of the inflation, right? But, but what, I, what I'm saying is you can squander it or you can store it. There's, there's two options, right? The third option is you can multiply it. So you say, I got $50. I'm going to go out and let's say I know I'm going to buy an apple tree for $50. I'm going to plant my apple tree in my yard. And in a few years, I'm going to get a bunch of apples. And then I'm not going to sell those apples. I'm going to take those apples, and I'm going to plant 15 more apple trees. And then in 20 years, I'm going to have a massive apple crop, and I'm going to start selling apples. Or apple cider, or apple sauce, or apple juice, or apple pies. And you're going to take those apples, and you're going to start using them to make more money. So what you've done now is you've taken your $50... And over time, you've multiplied your $50. So that you're now bringing in more assets, and then you can take those assets, and you can multiply them again. 
And as that multiplies, you can take them and you can multiply them again. So, right? So there's, there's three ways that you can use the last $50 that you have. One, squander. Two, hide. Three, multiply. And what I'm, what I'm suggesting to you is overall, God expects us to multiply what we've been given. He expects us to multiply what we've been given. But we live in a generation that squanders. Sometimes hides, sometimes hides, but often squanders and rarely produces and multiplies. Sometimes hides, often squanders and rarely multiplies. We live in a generation that sometimes hides, often squanders, rarely multiplies. Typically, it's a generation of not producers, but consumers. The, you know, you, people get money, and what do they do with their money? Well, I want to get, you know, I want to go get drunk with my money. I want to go get high with my money. I want to go buy pleasure with my money. I want to go get entertained with my money. And then it's gone. It has no productive or multiplying value in each instance. It's a quick high. It's a quick entertainment. And there's nothing in that that's profitable or productive in the long term. So this is a generation that consumes. And so if you have resources, before you spend your resources, you should ask the question in your mind, is this waste, squandering? Is this hiding, storing, or is this multiplying, producing? What is it? Now, sometimes it's a little more difficult to answer the questions because if you go out and you buy a new pair of jeans, it's not like the jeans are multiplying money, but at the same time, you're not going to be able to multiply money if you don't have pants, right? <laughs> so the jeans are useful, although they're not, right? they're, they're not multiplying money for you. But you do need pants to multiply money. So, you know, it's not always, it's not always cut and dry. And, and you say, well, you know, you go and you buy food. You go to the store and you buy food. Well, no, your food's not multiplying money, but if you don't eat, you're not going to multiply because you're just going to become emaciated and starve. But, it, but even, in, even in the type of foods that you eat and the type of foods you buy, you can, you can buy and eat foods that contribute to your energy levels or deplete your energy levels. Contribute to multiplication or take away from multiplication. So these are all things that you need to consider, right? So what, when you spend your money, how are you spending it? Are you squandering it? Are you hiding it? Or are you multiplying it? And I don't know if there's a third or a fourth way. And one of the ways that I think we fail in our society of ours, this squandering consumer society that is not full of characterized by production, but instead is characterized by consumption, is we fail to understand that having children and raising children properly, investing in them properly, is one way to multiply over the long term if you train them to be productive. Okay, so if you just have children and you train them to be consumers and they're not productive, that's not multiplication over the long time. You're just training people to right, take. But if you have children and you're training your children over the long term to be productive, this is long-term multiplication. Because you got to remember, when we're talking about multiplication, we're not talking about multiplication for me, right? I, when I'm trying to multiply my money, I'm not talking about multiplying it for me. When you're multiplying your money, you're not multiplying it for you. You're multiplying it for God. So I'm one man that works, and I'm trying to multiply what God's given me for the kingdom of God in the long term. And then let's say I have six children, which I do. And I train all six of my children, and God blesses my efforts in training them, and, and, and raising them properly, and then all six of those children go out, and they multiply my multiplication. So now I've got, if, if I have six kids, you know, with my, the same view of money that I have, the same view of wealth that I have, the same view of the world that I have, as opposed to just me multiplying for the sake of God's kingdom, now there's six more individuals doing it. And then let's say they all have six kids. 
Well, now there's 36 plus 6, which is 42, multiplying over the long term, contributing to the increase of public wealth. And when I talk about public wealth, I already defined what it is. I'm talking about public productivity. I'm not talking about government wealth. I'm talking about public productivity, the ability for society or a community to generate wealth. And so what I'm trying to say is, is that people say, well, kids are consumers. Kids take money. No, over the long term, if your view is that you want to contribute to long-term production and long-term prosperity and long-term multiplication, one of the ways to do that is multiplication by having kids and training them to be productive multipliers. So instead of having a society of consumers, what we have now, we produce a society of producers. But in order to reverse the trend, so we have a trend right now, I don't know if you've noticed, it's a society of consumers, very little productivity going on. It's, you know, a lot of stagnation or consumption and very few people using ingenuity or creativity to multiply and a lot of people that just want a bigger piece of the pie for themselves so they can eat it as opposed to multiply it. As, as we consider this, well, one of the ways that we should be doing this long term is consider children, investing in children, and training them properly. And when I talk about investing in children, what I mean is, is investing righteousness and the fear of the Lord into the children. So if some people say, well, I'm going to invest in my children, I'm going to show them that I love them by buying them a whole bunch of cheap garbage from China, right? It's plastic made in China, and here's a bunch of toys, kids, that shows you that I love you. Well, okay, so maybe there's a place for toys, and I'm not saying there isn't, but but the, like really what we want to teach the kids to do over the long term is to be producers and, and multipliers. So the greatest investment is in, in your children. I had someone once tell me, an older Christian told me, you know, she, she said, teach your kids to fear the Lord and let's let everything else take care of itself. And, and over time, right, this is, this is what will happen in a productive group of people is they learn to fear the Lord, they learn to produce, and then productivity within society and within the community follows all of that. Wealth is depleted when you have a generation of consumers, and wealth is multiplied as you have a generation of producers, and the only way to get out of this consumption society and into a production society is for each one of us to take control of our own homes, each one to take control of his own family. And so, you know, my family... This is, this is our view of wealth. This is our view of material possessions. We're going to have a biblical view. And we're going to try and build something not just for this generation, but over the generations. So that hopefully the kids can build. And then if you can, once your kids show responsibility and that they've learned how to produce and how to be self-disciplined, then you can invest into them monetarily and financially to help them get businesses started and build assets for their own families and so on. But you want to be wise in how you do that. You, want to, you don't want you know, wealth to come necessarily too easy because then they become entitled to it. But if you can help them once they learn how to handle it, then it's a wonderful blessing over the long term. But we want to be a group of people that aren't primarily characterized by consumption, but a group of people that are characterized by production. And there's a lot of industries out there that are consumption oriented. Not a problem with, we'll talk about consuming a little later on, but in the positives of it, but I'm talking about, you, you want to train people to think productively. Productively. How do you produce something, add value to something? And there's a few scriptural principles that come to mind as we talk about developing wealth. And I'll just give you a few. I'm just giving you principles today. And one of the ways that you develop wealth is you work diligently. Proverbs 10 verse 4 says, A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. What's that mean? means you, you, you find what your job is and you just do it, do it, do it over time, over time, over time. You know, you learn your trade, you apply your trade, and you just keep working at it. Right? You're not jumping from one thing to the next. You're just diligently working at what God's given you. God made you an electrician, then just work as an electrician, and or, you know, or there'll be something that opens up within that field, and it'll take you in another direction that's related. Or if God makes you a farmer, then work the farm. Right? Diligently Work whatever God's given you. And you have to submit the providence and all of this and where God's put you. And then another thing that you got to do as opposed to just being diligent and working hard. Some people work diligent and work hard, but they just end up on a treadmill. Is you have to look for opportunity. Proverbs 10 verse 5 says, He who gathers in the summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps and harvests is a son who brings shame. And so 
you got to have the ability and pray for your wisdom that God shows you when opportunities are there. you got to make hay when the sun shines. I mean, it, if you're a really, really hard worker, but there's no work to be done, then you're just running on a treadmill. And so it's one thing to work diligently it's another, and to work hard, but it's another thing to know when to work diligently and when to work hard and what to work hard at and what to work diligently at. And that's called looking for opportunity. you got to know when the sun's shining and be able to recognize that. Industry and enterprise. And then Proverbs 12, verse 11, talks about the importance of focusing on what's before you. Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. Some people want to go trace this dream and that trail and go down here, and they got no focus, and they're just squandering their energy everywhere. Right? And this calls for focus. Focus your energy on something that's worthwhile and that's of value, Look for opportunities, and over time, God will bless you. My dad always told me, he said to me, if you work hard at something and master something, over time, you will be blessed. Opportunity will arise. And this is what this text is talking about. And then practice delayed gratification. Proverbs 13, verse 11. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. So you're not out there trying to get rich quick. You're trying to slowly build capital, slowly build equity, slowly do things properly with integrity, and then over time, a lot starts to add up. <laughs> Scriptures say it's good for a man to bear his yoke in his youth. I think, I think there's value in teaching your children to start building capital and equity when they're teenagers and start developing then, especially in this economy where it's difficult to get into the housing market. They build a nice nest egg starting at the time they're 14 or 15, and you know, five, ten years, they could have a lot of money saved in order to buy something that's worthwhile and, and invest in it. But, and, and get rich quick type thinking just doesn't work, right? This is why the lottery is a bit of a problem. There's, I, I said to someone the other day, you know what the lottery is? It's, it's a tax on stupidity. That's all it is. You're giving the government more money and you're likely not going to get anything back from it. Go into the store, here's more money, Mr. Government, you can take more of my money. And they just dangle this carrot in front of you that you're never going to get. Gambling is just a fool's game. And it's not just a fool's game, it's greedy. People that are trying to gamble and trying to get rich by gambling or playing the lottery, they're trying to get rich and gamble, they're trying to do it at someone else's expense. If you win the lottery, what's that mean? That means that there's a whole bunch of other people that dump money into it, they got nothing in return. That's not a love your neighbor economy. A love your neighbor economy is, is I exchange value for value. And that's how an eco economies grow. If I try to exchange value for nothing, that's how economies shrink. It's a fool's game. And so value for value is growth. And, and um, get rich quick schemes are not typically value for value. Not everyone will be rich, but everyone should be productive. And the only job you should be ashamed of is a job poorly done. Not everyone will get rich, but everyone should be productive. And there's a link between godly living and productivity. So I'll give you an example. When, I, when I'm talking about developing wealth and I say there's a link between godly living and productivity, let's say you took everything I just talked about as far as wealth goes and wealth management in this sermon. Just, just the last 43 minutes, okay? See, so everything, including the reading of the Ten Commandments. And, and this is how everybody manages their wealth from this day forward in the whole world. Do you not think we'd be better off? As opposed to wasting money on this and being lazy here and squandering this, we'd be better off. And so what I'm trying to tell you is, is that there's a link between godly living and productivity. There's a link because the way God works is he works by the Ten Commandments. This is how the world is intended to operate. And so... Long-term multiplication, because we're not just talking about short-term, but long-term multiplication of wealth will not just be you building your own capital and equity, but it will be you contributing to institutions that help other people build capital and equity through godliness. So that would include, I believe, that long-term multiplication of wealth and productivity includes investing in sound churches, sound schools, and sound Christian publishing. Because all of these things teach people to think properly. And when people think properly, that's when wealth is multiplied over the long term. So our society is being depleted of wealth right now. How is it being depleted? Because people are ungodly. 
But the wealth was built by a godlier generation that took biblical principles and employed them. And that brings me to my third point. Whose wealth is it? Whose wealth is it? Donating wealth, who owns your wealth? So I've talked about what wealth is. I've talked about multiplying wealth, okay? And now what I'm talking about is who actually owns the wealth? Who actually owns the wealth? And to answer that question, first off, God does. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 26 says, For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And Psalm 50, verse 10 through 11 says, For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on the thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. It's God speaking. God owns the wealth. So what we don't want to do is we come to the aspect of private property and the Eighth Commandment. We don't want to come and say, we're, we, don't, we don't want to be absolutists in property rights. And when I mean that, what I'm saying is, you don't want to come to this and say, well, you know, it's my property, so I get to do what I want with it. That's not freedom. That's, that's what this generation believes. They're a generation of consumers. That's not God's view of property. When you come to property and assets and stewardship, what you do is you look at what you have and you say, freedom is, this is God's property. What does he want me to do with it? And when I can do what he wants me to do with it, then that's freedom. You, you do realize that, that most of what people consider to be freedom today, they can do in a jail cell? Yeah, I hope you understand that. What, what's, what do a lot of people consider to be freedom today? Having immoral sex, looking at porn, and doing drugs. Libertarian freedom. You can do all that in a jail cell. You can have, you play video games all you want and download porn all you want in a jail cell. But true freedom is taking what God has given you and then using it the way God wants you to use it. True freedom is owning assets and building with them. And God claims ownership over all of, your, all of your assets. And this is how wealth is developed. So we can't come to our assets and be absolutists and say, well, my property rights mean I get to do whatever the heck I want with my property. No. You come to it and you say, this is my property. God's given it to me. How do I use it in a way that honors him? And then that's true freedom. And using your property the way God wants you to use it entails donating a part of your wealth. Donating a part of your wealth. God claims a right to a portion of your money to use in a certain way through donations. And so let me just briefly go over the Old Testament tithing system, and then I'm going to make an, an application of the New Testament here. But in the Old Testament, there were three tithes, essentially. The first tithe was the institutional tithe, and that went to education, worship, law enforcement, the judiciary, and that was 10% of your net gains for the year. You were required to give this institutionally to the building up of good institutions. That is 10% of your net increase, your net gains. The second was the festivities tithe. And every year, the the people went to Jerusalem to the Feast of Tabernacles, and they spent 10% of their net gains on festivities. They'd have a party. Take 10% of their gains, they'd buy, you know, the choice wine, they'd buy the fattened calf, they'd have dancing, they'd have singing, and it was the the feast of the the booths, and, and, and it was a party. So God expects us to use our money. Part of the tithe was to use the money for joy and celebration because God is a God of joy. He's a God of thanksgiving. He's a God of celebration. So that's 10% of the increase would go to institution building. 10% of the increase would go to festivities for the family. And then every third year, 10% of the increase would go to poverty relief. And so that would amount to about 3% of your income because it was the 10% of the increase on the third year. And so you're talking about, in total, about 22 to 23%. But every third year, you were to give 10% of your increase to poverty relief, relief. And when I talk about poverty relief, I'm not talking about, you know, the able-bodied poor. I'm talking about the actual poor, the orphans, the widows, the disabled, and so on. And they were to be recipients of poverty relief every third year. And so you add all of these tithes up, and you end up with about 22%, and that was their entire taxation system in the Old Testament. All on the increase. 
uh, you know, there, no property tax, no sales tax, right? It, it, no, no EI, no CPP, just simply on the increase, the net gains. Whatever the net gains were, year over year, is what you were, you were tithing on, 22%, essentially. And so this contributed to growth over the long term. And you and I, we sit around and we look at this, and you say, wow, that, that would be a relief, wouldn't it? I mean, you're paying how much income tax? Then you're paying HST, sales tax, and then the producer pays sales tax, you pay sales tax, and then you're paying property tax, right? You're paying capital gains tax, and then, I mean, it goes on and on and on, your tax, for your taxes, for your taxes. And, and we can sit around, and we can complain about how much the government's stealing from us, and they are. It's theft, it's armed robbery, because it's unfair compared to the Old Testament tithing system. But here's the thing, God will not listen to our complaint about being stolen from by the government if we're, being, if we're stealing from God. Do you hear me? God will not listen to us complain about the government stealing from us if we're stealing from God. And Malachi chapter 3 says that our refusal to tithe is theft from God. It's an eighth commandment violation. So, so look, if we want to complain about what the government steals from us, we've got to take the plank out of our own eyes first. You've got to take the plank out of your own eye. And the government, they're a bunch of thieves. It's, it's becoming the biggest parasite going. But God will not hear our complaint. He will not listen to us until we deal with our own hearts and we start giving to him. Malachi chapter 3, verse 7 through 11 says, From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, How shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. Because, but you say, How have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. They were, they were refusing to give their tithes and offerings. So God accuses them all of being thieves. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test as the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the window of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. So, so the, people, the people were being, their, their produce and their, their increase was being devoured. And they're complaining about it because they weren't able to enjoy the fruits of their labor. And God says, if you start tithing, then I will rebuke the devourer. Stop stealing from me, and then the devourer won't steal from you. You see the correlation that I'm trying to draw here? Look, we're being devoured. We got a government that's a parasite. They take, they take, they take, they take, and there's no real return on the investment. And in fact, if you want to go use government services, you got to pay for them. Well, health care is free. Yeah, but, I mean, you're going to wait for it for months, and you, better, and you better be ready to pay for parking when you go down there. Right? And it's probably maybe going to be dirty in the hospital. Maybe. Okay? And, and then so, well, I, I mean, I'm paying, I'm paying taxes for my passport, but I've got to go in. I've got to wait in line. I've got to pay for my passport. I've got to pay for my driver's license. I've got to pay to get my license plate renewed. If I want to get a hunting license, I've got to pay for that. Right? All these things that my taxes are supposed to be funding, then I still got to pay for them out of my own pocket. And then so this text is saying, look, if you want to get rid of the devourer, you've got to give to the Lord his portion. And in fact, God sends the devourer to punish people who won't give to the Lord. When did all this, these social programs and all this waste start in our country? It started when the church stopped doing its job. It used to be the church that would build hospitals. It used to be the church that would build schools. It would used to be the church that provided the social safety net if someone fall, fell on hard times. It used to be God's people that would come out of their tithe. And as soon as the church started being derelict, then all of these crazy little schemes and programs stepped in, and the people started being robbed, and it worked for a little while, but it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and devours and devours and devours and devours. And, devours. and so there's a principle in this. And the principle in this is that you can't sit around and complain about being devoured if you haven't given to the Lord. I'll give you a few more scripture verses here to look at this. Proverbs 3, verse 9 to 10 
It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Proverbs 11 verse 24 says, one gives freely yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Proverbs 19 verse 17 says, Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. So you get to the New Testament. The New Testament doesn't really talk about tithing. The New Testament just says, give generously with a cheerful heart. So the Old Testament, you know what a tithe is. It's 10%. And then if you add it all up, if there's socials, you know, 10% for the institution building, 10% for the festivities, and then about 3% for every, 10% every three years. So about 3% for the relief of the poor. You say, well, it's, what's that in the New Testament? There's no real standard in the New Testament. It just says give generously and cheerfully. So I think 10% is a good baseline. If you want to ask what a baseline is, I think 10% is a good baseline. But, but you've got to ask this question. Like, you, you come to church and you worship the Lord in the church. I, I'm assuming, if you keep coming, I'm assuming it's been a blessing to your family. So what type of value do you attach to this level of blessing? I mean, if the church was gone and it didn't exist, how much would you be willing to pay in order for it to exist? How much value does the church bring to your family, bring to you personally? How much of a proportion of your income would you be willing to give in order for an institution like this just to exist? Does the amount of money that you give reflect the value that's associated with it? And so again, I'm not coming to you, I'm not saying it's 10, 20, 22 percent. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is that the New Testament commands you to give generously and cheerfully. There should be a portion being given to the building of institutions, particularly the church and Christian schools. And there should be a portion, a smaller portion, that's given to the relief of the actual poor. We have benevolence giving in the church, and that's been used. But you have to ask the question, does your giving reflect generosity to the work of God, or does it reflect theft from God? What does it reflect? Does your giving reflect the value of what you're receiving from the, from the institutions that serve you? And this is a question that you need to ask. Because God claims ownership over your property. It's not your property to do exclusively what you want with it. It's your property to use the way that God wants you to use it. And part of that includes giving. And here's the thing, the only way you're going to be able to replace some of the nonsense that's going on in high places is to build better institutions. I'll be honest with you, with all the money that the public schools suck out of people's pockets for nothing but trash and garbage to poison people's minds, we're doing better on a tighter budget at King Alfred Academy, on a much leaner budget, okay? So the only way to deal with the garbage that's out there is to build institutions that are better and that are run more lean, all right? Uh, to build churches, to train pastors. I mean, the, the, like I said, there's value even attached to a sermon like this because if people just take the principles of this sermon, long term, wealth will be generated. People's minds will change. They'll go from being consumers to producers, right? From stealing from God to giving to God, and then God brings in the increase. This is how God's economy works. So I've defined wealth, I've, decided, I've talked about what it is. I've talked about developing wealth, how to use it. And then I talked about donating wealth, who owns it. When you donate wealth, all you're saying is this is not mine. It's God. And God claims a portion of it to be used here. So he tests your heart so that you can voluntarily declare what the worth is of the service that you're receiving in the instances of institution building. What is wealth? How to use it? Who owns it? It all belongs to the Lord. Every last bit of it. And we should believe that it belongs to the Lord. And if we believe that it belongs to the Lord, we will manage it the way the Lord wants. And that's true financial freedom. True financial freedom is using your money the way God wants you to use it. Let's have prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for your word and your goodness towards us. And we acknowledge that yours is the cattle on the thousand hills. So we pray for your blessing upon us this day. We pray for your favor to shine upon us, your face to shine upon us. Help us to look to Jesus and help us to be faithful with all that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.